Mark chapter 6. I'll give you a second to get there. I just want to let you know I have the privilege of preaching tonight at the chapel service. And I'm going to give you this question. This is your trivia. This is your question to ask uh, that I'm going to ask you for tonight. What does MC Hammer, Michael Jackson, Willie Nelson, Abraham Lincoln, Donald Trump, all have in common? I am not going to answer the question now. You'll have to wait till tonight. Mark chapter 6. The Bible says, talking of Jesus, and he went from hence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day would come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence has this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought in his hands? Is this the, is this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah? And Simon, are not his sisters with us? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty works, Save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around about the villages teaching. You may be sitting. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you today for this 445. We ask you, Lord, that your mighty hand would be upon this service, Lord, that we would glorify you, that we would honor you, in everything that we do today. Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you sweep to the pews of this chapel, that you would have your way with every man that is here, even this preacher. And Lord, not, do not let me leave anything out of this message that you once said to these wonderful men that you've given me the privilege to be able to preach to. Lord, I pray that you bless everyone here and bless their families that are represented. And Lord, I pray that your name would be highly lifted up and adorned, and every man would say, Amen. Amen. We're reading a passage of Scripture where Jesus has gone into the synagogue, and we'll go a little deeper into that in a minute. But the gist of all of this was taken from a book that I read called Honors Rewards by John Brevere. And in it, I marveled at the fact that Jesus came to his hometown. And the Bible doesn't say that he didn't want to do any works, or he didn't want to do any healings, that he didn't want to take care of some folk. But in verse 5, and the Bible says, he could there do no mighty work. So right away, my mind goes wandering and wondering, why could not Jesus do any work in his hometown? What was it there that restricted him? Because obviously he's God, and if he decided he didn't want to heal in that particular town, he didn't have to. But there was something that caught my eye as I was reading this particular set of verses, and I read this book. And that was that when he was in the synagogue proclaiming that he was the Messiah, and we'll get to that, they did not honor him as God. They did not honor him as Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And because they did not honor him as Jesus Christ, the Messiah, he could do no healing. You see, many people want to be healed by God. Many people want to come to him and say, please heal me of this, heal me of that, whatever it may be. 
but they don't want to honor Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. They don't want to honor him as God. They want everything else in life as it is, and they want God to heal them besides. And many times you'll see people, they will completely ignore God, they'll trample down the word of God, and they'll trample down on, on Jesus Christ, kick them out of the schools, kick them out of the country, and then you'll have somebody that will say, God bless America. And you wonder, what is there for God to bless? You're not honoring him. And it's the same in our passage today. He could do no works because he was not honored. What is the response? Is this not the carpenter's son of Mary? Isn't this just an ordinary guy that fixes furniture, did some roofing, did some siding, fixed some furniture in my house? Isn't this just an ordinary guy that's claiming to be somebody that he's not? You see, when he was in the synagogue, they didn't regard him when he said that he was the Messiah as the Messiah. They did not honor him. And when you do not honor God, the blessings that come from not honoring him are not there. They're shut off. But as we turn, let's turn to the book of Luke in chapter 4. And Luke in chapter 4 is a familiar passage to us. I've preach probably six or seven messages out of this one passage alone, but I just keep on referring back to it because it fits so eloquently in what we are sharing. In Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 16, this is Jesus coming into the synagogue and opening the scroll. It says here that he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in that synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wonders at this gracious words, which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And in our passage that we started with, they were offended that he called himself the Messiah. You see, there wasn't a Jewish person alive at that time that did not know the verses that I just read to you out of the book of Isaiah. To these Jewish folk that were in the synagogue, this would be like John 3.16 to us. It would be like Psalm 23 to us. They were awaiting the Messiah. They were waiting for that one that would come, that would crush out the oppression of the Roman government would save them from that tyranny and set them free. They were looking for the Messiah to come down in a boldness, in a power, in a strength to be able to tear up everything and give them their freedom. They were not looking for what Jesus was offering. And Jesus clearly stated that he came to do all these wonderful things and there are some verses, if you read the last part of Isaiah, I believe it's going to be 60 or 61, where these verses are taken from. Verses 1 through 3. There's a part of these verses he did not read. These are part of the verses that he's saving for his second coming when he returns. But he read these verses and the people were offended. He called to Christ. And even John the Baptist, who loved him and was the forerunner of Christ, was in jail, facing execution, his head being ready to be chopped off, and he sent his disciples onto Jesus, and he said, 
Jesus. They said, Jesus, are you the Messiah or should we go look for another? And Jesus boldly proclaimed, look at what you see around you. I have proclaimed everything that I said as I read in that temple. Everything that I read in the synagogue was true. And then some that wasn't even recorded in the word of God. He says, you go back and you tell John that what you have seen and heard is exactly true. He is the Messiah. And when you honor him by who he is and by the office that he holds, your life will begin to change. When you honor Christ for who he is and what he's done on the cross as we just celebrate Easter, your life will change. But they looked at him and they said, there's no way that this is the Messiah. And they would refuse to accept him as the Messiah. And as such, they lost the blessing. They lost many blessings they could have had had they only honored him as the Messiah. And you say, well, why, why did he do that this way? You see, Jesus saw a greater need in the people than the outward expression. He saw something greater that they needed other than the oppression of Rome. He saw a need that they had was far greater than what they even knew they needed. They needed to be saved from their sin. They needed to be saved from their wretchedness. They needed to be saved from this penalty of sin and the wages of sin, which is death. And the Lord made a way out of no way. Jesus came down and he paid that penalty on the cross for your sins and mine. The ultimate sacrifice Jesus made for you and me because he saw a greater need than the outer. He'll take care of the outer in his second coming, but he saw a greater need and that was salvation. For man that couldn't even see their sin, couldn't even see their way out of darkness, to see that they were in need of a savior. And even though you and I were blind, we could not see that need, Christ did. He was looking out after you and I when we weren't even looking out for you and I. He made a way that you and I could never do. You cannot work your way to heaven. There's no sacrifice that we could possibly make to appease the anger and the and the reverend and the holiness of God. But he made a way out of no way. If you have your Bibles turned to Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 18. This is a wonderful story. And let me set the stage for you. There is a crowded house, a building, full of people looking to be healed, looking for people to want Christ to do something in their life, hoping that they would do something, but they don't honor him. And so we start in verse 18, and it says, Behold, men brought in a bed a man which had been taken with the palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. But they couldn't. The place was packed. People were religious people. There were lay people. There were all kinds of folk listening to him. And when they could not find a way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and led him down to the tilling, tiling with his couch unto the midst of before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Men, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious folk of that day, began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said unto them, Why reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easy to say, Thy sins be forgiven, or take up thy Take, rise up and walk. What is easier to say? You see, there were a whole room full of people wanting to be saved. A whole room wanting to be healed. But Jesus didn't heal any of them. 
But men with faith that honored God and honored who he was as the Messiah had the fortitude, had the faith to lower a man through a roof of a house into the very presence of God that he may be healed. You see, they honored God. And because they honored God, they were blessed by this man being healed. They honored God because they knew that Jesus Christ was who he said he was back in the synagogue in chapter 4. They believed he could heal, and they honored him as God. And so here is a perfect example of when you honor God, and you honor who he is, and you have a respect for him and a proper fear, not being scared, but honor him as God. Your life will change as this man's life did change. If you have your Bibles, turn to John or Matthew chapter 8. Here's another incredible story. Matthew chapter 8. Starting at verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servants, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to him that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith in all of Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Here's a centurion that worked for the Roman government. And if he was the centurion, I think he was, the centurions were in charge of 6,000 people. He was in status in that time. He was ahead of Christ. Christ was a Jewish. They were down here. The Romans had control over the empire. He's up here. And here's the man that's up here asking for the man down there to heal. And the reason why the centurion did this because he understood that Jesus Christ was Lord. And he honored him. He honored Jesus Christ because he knew his position. And he knew Christ's position. And he knew that although he was not a Jewish man, although he was in higher rank than Christ, he honored Jesus for who he was. And in doing so, by honoring Christ for who he was, Jesus was marveling. Because he, he understood this. And Jesus honored him by saying, yes, your daughter is healed. The person that you seek is healed. And that very hour, that person was healed. And Jesus marveled because of that man's faith. You see, gentlemen, what would our lives be if we not only ordered, honored God for who he was, but we honored other people? And we should honor other people because Christ has made them in his likeness. He has made them for a purpose and plan. You can't just honor somebody because it's not in our nature to do so. We have to ask the Holy Spirit who lives within us, if you know Christ, to say, Lord, help me to honor other people. I honor you. I honor every single one of you. But the reason why I honor you is not because it's a natural part of who I am, but it's because of what Christ has done in me that I could do that. 
I honor you because I know that Christ has made you purposely for a specific purpose and plan. I know he's made you with certain gifts that I don't have. He's made you with certain talents that I don't have. And he's given every one of you a soul that's worth so, so much. And he loves you so, so much. Honoring one another honors God. Honoring your boss, honoring the social services, honoring the cops, honoring the people that work here at the rescue mission is honoring God. In Romans 13 and 1, God has established a place, put people in paths ahead of us, in charge of us. My boss, I have to honor because God had put him there. And if I dishonor my boss, I'm dishonoring God. If I'm here at the rescue mission, I dishonor Brother Carl, I dishonor any of the front people in the front or security, I'm dishonoring God because God put them in charge of where they are and where they're at. I got to honor what they say, I got to honor what they want. And if I don't, I'm dishonoring God. And lastly, we have to learn to honor ourselves. We don't naturally honor ourselves. But the Bible says this, that when you honor other people, you honor yourself and you honor God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4 and 8, that there is a promise of this life that is now and is which to come. There's a promise of a blessing, and I'm not a prosperity gospel, I, I ain't none of that, but I believe what Christ is saying, that there is honor. When you give him honor, there's a blessing of your life will just go better. Things will go better for you. The favor of God will be upon your life to accomplish that which he had for you. I just believe all of that. And I believe all of that because honoring to God is important. When I look at the Ten Commandments and I, and I go to Exodus in chapter 20 where the Ten Commandments are located, I find this very astonishing fact that just blows my mind. In the very Ten Commandments that are listed in Exodus chapter 20, it says this, it says, the, the verse number 12, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that the days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God has given thee. And the Lord has these in order for a reason, but the Lord has this particular commandment above stealing, above killing, above committing adultery. The honoring of your mother and father, it says in the New Testament, if you honor them in Ephesians chapter uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and 1. It's the first promise. It's the first commandment with a promise that it will go well with you in your life if you honor your father and your mother. There's a blessing established with that just because you're honoring them that, that are ahead. And, and the Lord in the Ten Commandments also establishes that as something important. But lastly, I want to go to 2 John. In John 2. Second John 1 8. Hallelujah. Thank you for the ruffling of leaves. Bible says, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Gentlemen, I don't want to walk this world to get a partial reward. I'm not in this place to kind of just pass on through and hope I make it. But I want to be before the Lord and receive a full reward. A full reward that is given because I honored God in everything that I do. 
And I need help there. I need help. I'm not there. And everything that I do, I need is help. And I could see that that was not a normal part of who I am, but indeed, it was something that God had allowed me to do. Gentlemen, if we get this thing of honor, <coughs> honor into our hearts and ask Christ to help us with it, you will see a different you. You will see your different outlook on life. Your psyche, your whole who you are changes when the Holy Spirit changes you from the inside out. And you realize that honoring God, honoring others, and honoring yourself, because the Bible clearly states we need to honor ourselves. And we need to honor ourselves, not look down upon ourselves, not to belittle ourselves, but to know that Christ has created you, to know that Christ has a purpose for your life, and he wants to do something spectacular with it. I know I preach it all the time, but I just can't get away from it because I know. I know that God wants to do something spectacular. There are preachers in this place. There are deacons in this place. There are Sunday school teachers in this place. These are, there are missionaries in this place. There are men in here that God wants to use for the praise of his glory. And if we can get this thing of honor right, whew, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for the 445. We thank you for every man that is here. We thank you, Lord God, how you worked in this room today to be able to show the blessing of honoring you, the blessing of honoring others, and the blessing of honoring ourselves. And Lord, I pray that if there are men here today that cannot see that, they cannot do it. There is an ample supply of the Holy Ghost that lives within us that is able to change our hearts, to change our attitudes, to change who we are. For some of us, Lord, there's going to be no change in our lives until we get honor right. And when we get honor right, there's no end to what Christ can do. And I pray for every man in this place, including myself, I know, Lord God, that I need to honor better. And Lord, I ask you, Lord God, that you would work in all of our hearts and that you would change what only you can change. And I ask you, Lord God, that you would bless every man.